preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I'm Deborah Seymour, Associate Director of the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning at the 92nd Street Y. I am pleased to welcome you to a special panel with our prolific guests, Agnes Gund, Roberta Smith, and Elizabeth Murray, and their well-known moderator, Leonard Lopate. Leonard Lopate, a great friend of the wise, and also celebrity host of WNYC AM and FM talk shows, Leonard Lopate, and Sunday talk show, Survival Kit at 2 p.m., interviews some of the most interesting and up-and-coming personalities of our times. Mr. Lopate has interviewed anyone and everyone from politicians to poets, from medical researchers to actors and dancers. Trained as a serious painter, he studied with Ad Reinhardt and Mark Rothko and worked in advertising for 15 years. Given his first talk show in 1977, however, what began as a momentary whim now has become his life's work. Leonard has interviewed people on topics from the most serious to the most esoteric, always striving to be engaging and enjoyable. Tonight, the dialogue between our guests and moderator focuses on the topic of women in the art world. This evening's format will be as follows. Mr. Lopate will introduce our esteemed guests, and the panel discussion will then proceed for about 45 minutes. A half hour question and answer period will follow the discussion, during which Mr. Lopate will take questions from the audience and direct them to our guests. You have been handed cards upon which to write your questions, and our ushers will come up and down the aisles during the, the panel discussion to collect the cards so that the cards can be handed to Mr. Lopate for the question and answer period. And now, please join me in welcoming our renowned moderator and 92nd Street Y favorite, Leonard Lopate. Thank you, Deborah. A little over 100 years ago, a critic wrote in Art News, women pushed themselves to the foreground everywhere, but the result in art is rather dissatisfactory and tiresome. Why did they paint such trifling subjects? And he went on to complain that they always imitate men. Contrast that with Hans Hoffmann's famous comment to Lee Krasner in 1937, this is so good you would not know it was painted by a woman. Well, the year is 2002, and although no one would dare say such things like that today, the Gorilla Girls will tell you that we still have a long way to go. I'm sure the participants in tonight's glittering panel have a few thoughts of their own on the matter, and I want to bring them out right now. Elizabeth Murray's ebullient, quirky-shaped canvases seem to appeal to almost everyone in the art world. Time Magazine's Robert Hughes described... <laughs> Described her as a master colorist without inhibitions whose paintings give a powerful sense of the womanly experience, an artist whose effort goes beyond style, beyond pat categories of abstract and figurative, which gives her work its sweet, rambunctious, and very American life. Agnes Gund became a trustee at the Museum of Modern Art in 1976. She served as president of the museum's board since 1991, but she hasn't attained that exalted position simply as a reward for her philanthropic work. Ms. Gund has a master's degree in art history and has personally collected over 400 works of art. She was awarded the National Medal of the Arts by Bill Clinton in 1997 and deserved it. Roberta Smith has also worked at the Museum of Modern Art, but as a secretary in the Department of Painting and Sculpture. That was not long after she graduated from college. Since then, she's assisted a famous artist, run a prominent gallery, and from 1973 on has contributed art criticism to all of the leading art magazines, The Village Voice, and she has been an important art critical presence at the New York Times since 1986. I, I wonder if you think that the uh, Gen Gentileschi show at the Met has gotten so much attention because Artemisia, no matter how good she is, is a woman. 
No, because I think there, I actually wanted to buy one of her father's works of art that was sold at auction about a year and a half ago, a very small painting of the Holy Family. And the reason I've always liked Jen Dolesky, the father, as well as the daughter, was because I think he made such uh, amazing uh, work with color, especially with color and with shape and form. And I think they're overlooked artists, her father, uh, really more than the daughter. The daughter, I think, uh, um, came to be recognized and liked only because of the story um, that she had. But maybe that's not the... Well, maybe that, well, that was, uh, I guess, what I was aiming at uh, with the question. I'm not sure everybody here is going to agree, but... Um, it's always my take that Orazio's work always looks a little better than, than Artemisia, but maybe that's understandable un, under the circumstances. But still, is she... Roberta, you're giving me that well, look. Well, I haven't seen the show yet, so I'm sitting here thinking... Oh, uh, God. I've seen the show a lot. Um, but I think that any... You know, whenever there's a museum exhibition, whether it's of a man or a woman, you have to take into account how much the life story contributes to the appeal of the artist, either in mounting the exhibition or the way it's presented to the public. And it's always an issue, you know, I think, you know, no matter, almost no matter who. Mm -hmm. you know. Do you want to add to this, Elizabeth, or? Um, I haven't seen the show yet either. Okay. Um, I, I intend to see it and I'm looking forward to it. But yes and no, like I do think that um, I agree probably uh, from the work I've seen that Orazio is a fascinating painter and very interesting. And I do think that Artemisia is definitely, because she's a woman right now, that the show is is getting more attention, which is just to me just very sad because I think she's a really interesting painter also. But obviously it's the rape story that uh, has grabbed a lot of people's attentions. And uh, I wonder how far this goes. Like we but see an awful lot. lot. Excuse me? That says a lot that, that she was victimized by a rape Although and yet we're not went sure. on to make some pretty interesting paintings. Although we're not sure it was really a rape and there was a, it's a complicated story, but yeah. because of that story uh, and other stories, is I wonder if that's the reason that we have George O'Keefe and Frida Kahlo calendars, but we don't have Eva Hesse calendars or Helen but, Frankenthaler calendars or, yeah. or Louise Nevelson calendars or... Um, but could I or a very think... great artist here, Elizabeth Murray calendars. Or do we have Elizabeth Murray calendars? Well, we should. Not <laughs> no. But well, one of the things I I'm think... Too, it's okay with me if I never get a calendar. <laughs> it's interesting is that also one thing we didn't pick up on was Artemisia's art is seen as, as feminist because she did, did this subject so often of Judith and the Holofernes and seems to have been by critics made it more bloody and gory and more in the feminist tradition. I think that's a shame because I think she's doing it as a, a painter and from the point of view of a painter. And I think as Roberta said, it isn't really whether she was a man or a woman painting those. If you didn't know it was a woman, I think you wouldn't put, put so much emphasis on it being feministly done. So I think that it it is a shame to see it in that guise because I think looking at her work, some of her work is so beautiful and it has the same use of great color that her father um, does have also in his paintings. Well, I don't want to pick on Artemisia, but um, in his review of the Gendaleski show, Arthur Danto suggested that she brought a woman's insights into the way she painted even the most traditional subjects, even the female nude. And, uh, and Roberta, let me ask you this. Um, when you're looking at work that could be done by a man or a woman, is that different than if, it, if you know it is done by a woman or if it's done by a woman who has a really interesting story, is married to somebody who's interesting or who has had a very colorful life? Well, I think the process of looking at art and, in my case, writing about art, but either in any event, figuring out what you think about art, which is what anybody who's interested in art does one way or the other. Elizabeth figures out what she thinks about her own painting. I think I figure out what I think about other people's work. All I would say is that you just 
that stuff gets goes through your mind, and then it has to be, you just work with it, and some of it's white noise and some of it isn't. I mean, today, the gender of the artist is often very clear in the work and the subject matter and the point of view, so it's sort of hard to avoid it in some cases. But there was a time when some women chose to show as men, like Grace Hardigan, who called herself George Hardigan at one point, or as a androgynous. Uh, I remember Nancy Graves called herself N. Stevenson Graves when she mm -hmm. first showed uh, because she didn't want people to look at, well, I don't know whether she didn't want the rejection that a woman artist would get or whether she didn't want people to look at the work as a woman's art. Well, she started showing at a really different time than now. I mean, she started showing what in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. That was before AIR was formed. That was... Grace Hardigan even earlier yeah. in, the, in the early 50s. I mean, obviously, women are and have been always very aware of their position in the world and that it's not equal to the position of men and they've compensated for that in different ways. But I would say with Nancy Graves because I, I would say that she had more influence than has been noted by critics or by people looking at it on her husband than husband Richard Serra than anyone has been willing to give her credit for. And I think like so many women that ha have been married to male artists that are women artists, <laughs> they, they, uh, there is that inequity of influence or of, well, Lee Grasner just paints like Pollock, a little like Pollock, but Dorothy Dana good. ran into that too yeah. with David and, Smith. And so I think that that's our Lane de Kooning. Well, it was just, you know, um, because she was with de Kooning. And, and there, there are a lot of more, uh, a lot less willingness to go with the camels, the whole idea of the, um, you know, animals in the cages and that, that um, happened when Nancy and Richard were married than, than people will ever give her credit for. But I think even Richard now would, if he were pinned down on it, would give her credit, because I've talked to him about it a couple times. I wonder if he would have done as well if he'd called himself Ricky Sarah or something like that. <laughs> something where he could have been a woman or a man. Uh, Elizabeth, you said that you turned yourself into an asexual gnome when you started. Um, well, that's true. I did. But I didn't, I decided, I realized it wasn't deciding. I realized that I really wanted more than anything else in the world to be an artist and to paint when I was about 20. Um, and I think that I had no, I, I'd never heard the word feminism or sexism. I didn't know anything about it. I was going to a school in Chicago where there were a lot of like heavy duty ex-Korean War vets around actually, even in 1960. So it was a pretty macho world, but I was completely, nobody ever told me that because I was a girl, I couldn't be a painter. It didn't even occur to me. Um, but somehow I intuited unconsciously that to do this, I was going to have to like withdraw from any kind of idea of having boyfriends, being a regular girl that I had to really like focus completely on being an artist. And that was what I did. I just painted as much as I possibly could at home, at, in the school. I looked at painting. I constantly and the idea that I would like you know, get much less get married or have a family was like something I didn't even think about my idea of being an artist that you locked yourself into a garret and I suppose unconsciously I did want to be I'm not so sure I wanted to be like the guys or one of the guys I wanted them to respect me and consider me to be equal so what happened? You got married, you had kids. Eventually, quite surprisingly, I did. In fact, very soon afterwards, I think, <laughs> right. when I was 23. You um, had to establish yourself as an artist while you were bringing up kids. Well, I didn't. Yeah, I did. Yeah. But that's a whole other thing. You know, like, Men don't have to deal with that as much. They can have kids well, and leave them back with the then. wife. I mean, I was a mother and a wife and an artist. I was not, I was married to a man who was 
who was trying hard to be fair and respected me enormously. So I wasn't in a situation where I was with some guy who was saying, okay, now, this is, you know, I'm the artist here. You better take... I wasn't in that situation at all. But what effect But I knew people it, who were. What, what effect do you think it had on your work? Marriage and... Yeah, about trying to wear all those hats at the same time. Balance um, them. I was so determined to figure it out and be an artist. It was so important to me. And I was very ambitious um, that... Um, I managed to do it. I think the big issue for me, I have to say and be totally honest, wasn't my then husband, it was more my son. And um, the conflict was enormous. It wasn't easy to love two things. <laughs> you know what the biggest thing was? I felt at the time that some, for some people, it, was very, it would have been very important for me to say that my work was more important than my kid. And I think men could say that kind of, not consciously, but could feel that. And I could never do that because it wasn't true. Aggie, you mentioned Lee Krasner and Pollock, but um, if anyone who's, for anyone who's seen the film, it was apparent that she'd made a commitment to a husband and sacrificed her own chances. And what was not made clear was whether she was still, uh, you know, she may have been a good artist or not a good artist, but she was married to one of the most important artists of the 20th century. And um, uh, was that sacrifice warranted? Well, I do think in those days, and I think it's still true, it's true of somebody like Louise Bourgeois, though her husband was not an artist. He was an art critic, and he was um, somebody where the attention was more focused on him from the public. Um, I think that the attention just wasn't going to go to a woman no matter what she did at that time. And I think that that was part of the reason that Lee, but I think Lee was an exceptional person. I think she was um, somebody that really did go through a heck of a lot that was bigger and larger than I think any of us that are women have to really face with mostly with a, a husband and children it, because this was not an ordinary husband and, and mm -hmm. he wasn't an ordinary person and he was very conflicted and I think in many ways that, um, that she was, uh, was going to do this because uh, she cared about him but also because she really did think he was a good artist. But what would happen? That's basically what is what makes the difference is not whether you're woman or man, but whether you really understand what it is to be an artist. And I think that's what Elizabeth was trying to get at the the drive. I think though she had the drive, she knew that her husband had the drive more. But I think that her business of wanting to have it, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, because I think it's a very important thing for people to know that it was really Lee Krasner that set up the Pollock Krasner Foundation, but that she wanted it Pollock first. And, you know, who's to know what went on in her head or what with the feelings? But I think she she's a very good artist on her own. I still wonder what it would have been like if it had been reversed, that the creator of Jackson Pollock's work had been the wife and the creator of Lee Krasner's work had been the husband, whether... Uh, well, whether, there's whether something I want to talk about because I think that we sort of glossed over something that's kind of interesting. I don't think that the point of feminism or feminist art history is to make everybody equal. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and argue that Lee Krasner is as good an artist as Pollock. Um, Thank you. I, I don't think she is. Um, so few artists I would are. argue that maybe Blanche Lozelle, who did not have Stieglitz in her life, was about as good as O'Keeffe. And to my taste, I, she appeals more to my sensibility. Um, but I do think that, I mean, not to get personal with Elizabeth, but I think that um, if your first husband had wanted to be an artist's wife, your marriage might have lasted. <laughs> In that you were clearly more talented than he was. 
or he, he, you know, I mean, I don't want to, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. Don't you think it, I mean. I think that's really interesting and true. So, <laughs> so you have a willing, you know, I think what Krasner did was sort of sacrifice herself. So in some ways it isn't really, the reason you don't want to say, or you might struggle to say she's as good as Pollock is because you don't quite know how good she could have been. Because for, for, as for while Pollock was alive, she sort of put her career on hold during a very important time. But this is what, I think this is what happens. And I think this is what has happened with all couples in mostly that it's always been that the man could first of all sell, I think important thing that it, we're forgetting to talk about is what is the market and what is the market for women artists? And I know it isn't good. I used to take friends of mine around that were women artists to dealers that I thought would be sympathetic and they said, well, she's good, but she's a woman and we can't sell women because people don't think that they have an investment. This was 20 years ago or so, but not that long ago for that to happen. And I think that the reason that there wasn't an Elizabeth Murray stronger than her husband was because at that time, really, we weren't giving the spots. I, I went through a whole list of, of dealers that were women, and I tried to think of who they had had in their stables that Well, were an women. interesting example yeah. uh, would be Lee Bontecu. Who, well, Lee Bontecu, who is much a, a, a better artist than her husband, and who left Castelli because Castelli kicked her husband out. So wives are always better, more likely to be the support no system doubt. for their husbands. Pardon? Wives are generally more likely to be the support system for their husbands, rather than the other way around. I mean, she did that. Lee Bontecu did that, too. Right. So I, I have to say about Lee Bonacu that I've just um, recently bought some of her drawings that she did early on that they're now letting out. But when Lee Bonacu was the reason that she's in the state theater is everybody thought she was doing stuff that was tough enough, tough enough to be really out there. And it goes back to Elizabeth Murray's Artist Choice show at the Modern. I think it's very much a draw from that because it was big, it was powerful, so it was okay. Then when she started doing these flowers and these fish and these other things, yeah, people said, point. no good, mm. and didn't like it anymore. So the so. work became sort of more, more feminine mm -hmm. in its sensibility. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point, like, because I do think in the last 20 years, something really has happened, oh, sure. and, and I mark the time, the early 70s and the re, advent of the advent of a new feminism. For me, it made a huge difference because I began to get jobs in colleges so I could afford, I got more money. So something different happened for me then. But I think that there were a lot of things going on then that changed things for women. And a support system started to develop and women started to see themselves differently. But at the same time, at that time, I saw which is a whole other realm of discussion, like that those pieces of Bonacuse, the ones that, that put her on the map in the art world, were so strong, so gutsy, so raw, and, and still, you know, very much about a kind of psychological in and out and, and opening in. But when she did in the 70s, in the mid 70s, when she started to do the glass pieces, it was pathetic, it was sad to see how people responded to that. And I personally was incredibly taken aback. I wanted to see something different. I wanted her to continue the other work. But I think it is the, the idea of what's feminine and what people will take in terms of women's work that does open into that. But there is that other factor, um, getting back to Krasner and Pollock, I remember Dorothy Daner telling me about how when she met David Smith, he knew very little about modern art and she introduced him to all sorts of things, whether it's true or not, that's the story she told. And then they went to Paris and he said, I'm meeting Picasso tomorrow. And she said, oh good, when do we go? He said, no, not you, this is guys only. And she was very upset because uh, she felt that she had 
they were a partnership, you know. Uh, is, is something changed today we, when we see a couple like Eric Fischel and April Gornick? Uh, is that an indication of, of um, any kind of change in, in, in those husband and wife perceptions? I don't think that most women, many women would absolutely not stand it. They would walk away. Or, and, and very few men who would be married to, who would be partners with, let's just say in partnership with a strong woman artist, would dare to do something like that. That's what, I don't know, what do you Times think, Roberta? But, but I do think there's still an inequity in partnerships. I think that it's still, as I think, the marketplace, because I think um, Eric Fischel's work um, sells for more than April's, and whether or not it's better is a question that I think each person has to ask themselves. And I'm not sure that it's based on whether it's better or not. I think it's still that the amazing thing is how few women really do end up getting the prices that men do. And for their work, even if it's as strong. And, and I think that I'm afraid that I, I really feel with all the partnerships, like Ellen Phelan, I saw a show recently. I thought it was a very good show. Um, but, you know, she's married to a, an artist, Jill Shapiro, that is going to command more of a price. And most of mostly in these cases, the women are at different galleries than the men, some of them like April at the gallery that Eric started in, but then moved from. And that, I think, makes a difference, too. So I think it, you know, it does depend on how somebody pushes for you. Well, it was interesting to see that article on Mary Phelan in The New Yorker, in which one of the reasons she got in trouble is because some man complained that the women were cursing in the office. They were saying obscene things. It used to be the other way around. Um, I think it was Mary Boone who said, who defended the fact that there were a small number of women being shown in her gallery by saying that she's a businesswoman first and the collectors, as you say, Aggie, in general, prefer the work of male artists. Roberta, when you were working for that short time for Paula Cooper, did was that the general perception there? Well, I was sort of in a pre-conscious state at that point, <laughs> so it's really hard to tell. <laughs> but you must have heard I mean, people. Paula probably. was very, I worked for Paula Cooper for about two and a half years in, uh, for about, about 30 years ago, um, when she was still in Soho. Even before Elizabeth. In her first her. address in Soho, if, every, if anybody knows where that was. Um, up above Finale, sort of. Um, I think Paula was interested in showing women. Yeah. And I think at that point, she had Elizabeth, Jackie, Jennifer, and Bengalis, and that was probably a really a really high percentage. But Mary, More than practically any other gallery in New York, I would think? I would think so. I was trying to think it's about that today. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I thought, and compared to Ilniana Sonobin, who I don't know an artist, woman artist, that she's ever shown. Well, Miss Hilla Becker. I mean, th yeah. there are two couple. teams that she's shown. Um, oh, but I think that, uh, I forget what I was going to say. We were talking about Sorry. whether certain women who have galleries have at least attempted to, no, or whether that, they've been know, business Mary people. Mary Boone was, is a completely different, has a completely different idea of what she was doing, and she was doing something in a different time. And in the early 80s, there was this kind of regression where painting Painting be became the dominant art, and, and it became very dominated by males. You know, it was just, and I think that it, unfortunately, things go back and forth. I mean, I actually think that this would take a lot of research, but I think that there was a kind of narrowing down that also happened with the abstract expressionists, and that the, their success had something to do with that. That if you look at American art, say 1900 to 1940 or 35, when the, nobody really knew what the stakes were, uh, things were a lot looser. There are a lot more women around, and and I think that you know you can talk about well the art was macho. You know, there are lots of reasons that that would happen. It's very, you can't say it's any one reason, but you can sort of see it happen. I was really interested in um, 
the uh, Catherine Dreyer bequest, looking through that, there's a thick book of the catalog raisonné of that, and she was buying art from about 1917 to, to the early 30s, most actively. And there were an amazing number of women that she bought, and clearly, she, I think she probably did it, you know, intentionally, um, that I had never heard of, you know, that are just slipped through the cracks. So I think that everybody's involved with, there are lots of different things that have to happen. Well, whenever the stakes are not high, women tend to be represented more after, around the time of the Russian Revolution. Uh, there was when some amazing art was being made, much of it was being made by women, and then when the dust settled, they all seemed to disappear, and uh, we wind up with Malkievich and Rachenko and a few other names. But I remember seeing a major exhibition uh, that was in Washington and L.A., and I was just shocked by how much great art was from women. Uh, I think every time things loosen up, it probably happens, and then tightens again when there's money to be made, and then suddenly we have David Sally and but I think Julian Schnabel making might all the be money. Different. I'm not sure because I think that there have been enough women making art that the whole tenor of art has has changed. Well, you and were with. I'm sorry. Between what women have done and what gay artists have done, that that there's been a kind of I don't know. It just seems much more open to me, and it seems like there's a much more many more kinds of sensibilities. You know, that you could, in a cliche, just des describe running a spectrum from ma masculine to feminine um, are in evidence. You were at uh, Paula Cooper for 20 years, and then you left her for a, a gallery owned by men. Um, but was this had nothing to do with it? Oh, no. <laughs> no, it had nothing to do with it. Um, I mean, you know... The, you can, that, that's a, an extremely complicated thing. I mean, there are many, there are in this country, in New York, in the gallery world and in the world of the museums now, to some extent, men that can genuinely, I think, appreciate and enjoy across the board, women's work, and not have gender be a part of their judgment. I agree with Aggie and Roberta 100% about the economics of it. Like one thing, I remember two remarks that have been made to me that have been really sexist remarks, um, although I didn't see them as that at the time. I remember a young man saying to me in art school, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? And it took me, I was so stunned by that that I, it took me years to sort of even think about what he could have possibly met. And then about 10 years ago, somebody said to me, when I really thought I was doing great, I was making a living from my work, I had everything I wanted, a nice place to live, a really nice partner, children that I was able to support. Everything seemed great. And he said, you know, you're never going to make it until one of your paintings sells for $500,000 at auction. And I, I was so, I, what are you talking about? And it, but when I, I immediately realized, it didn't take me years to figure that one out. That was when, <laughs> the, in the early 90s, when I was beginning to like really realize what the economics, I mean, you're so naive, really, about what goes on with money and and collectors, and and basically, I didn't want to know. But yes, I think that was that is absolutely true, and it certainly is far from that with my work now. But if I if you let those things get to you as an artist, you're dead. I mean, it's ridiculous. But it's interesting to note how many women are in important positions as art critics, curators in the museums. Most of the museums have. Uh, well, at a certain level. I mean, women are always permitted to be caretakers, in, in, in however broadly you describe that term. So critics and curators are, are caretakers of a sort. But can't they then and, affect change? And one other thing I would say is that I think that, that there are women in, in museums, but, but if you get up to the upper levels, they're still, men are still dominant. Mm -hmm. And it's still, I think it's very hard to get Women. Somebody told me the other day, "Oh, look at all the women in the uh, American 
uh, museum director's uh, group, and I said, but they're not at the top museums, and they haven't been let into New York at all. I mean, no woman has been chosen for the ma a major museum. Cooper Hewitt has had women, but not the other. Well, Thelma Golden was rose pretty high. At, at she was the, the director. The, the, no. was the director she of, was fired of the major <laughs> yeah, by the next director. And, and that was because she threatened as such a good, good curator. I, I think... You know, now, I think even in the search for the replacement for Kirk, there are some, one, I think especially, but a number of really good women, but I would be very surprised if it went to a woman. That would be a huge sign of change if that, I was thinking about that on the way up, actually. Do you feel, Aggie, a responsibility to push for the inclusion of more women at MoMA in the collection or on staff? Well, I think I, I feel um, actually more, again, it's the person that if they're capable. But what I compare it to is sort of like American orchestras. I come from the best orchestra city in the country, from Cleveland, Ohio. And it um, what was looking for a director, and there was... Bill Schumann was trying to get them to look at Americans, and he said they will never take an American, they will only take a European. Well, it's the same, I think, unfortunately, for the men that really are in charge of the museums, um, largely, and the, the board of trustees. I mean, when I step down as president, there will be nobody that is in the major uh, officer positions that is a woman. And this is, and it, this museum was started by three women, but it's still so it largely and the men run. And if if those men will then choose, are going to along with the director, who's a man, choose the women that come up. And I think they they choose in the same sensibility that they choose an orchestra leader that's European. He's got to be better because he's European. And in this sense, they've got to be better because they're men. Somehow, you know, the women haven't had the background, the experience. And it's just like when they used to say an architect, if you wanted to get a good architect to build a museum, but you couldn't get somebody that hadn't built a museum. Well, now, how do you get an architect to build a museum if you don't? That's um, loosened up because of the European model, where they have gotten younger people to do museums before they've done anything. But, and, but that's still, look at that for architecture. Look at, we're talking about the arts. How many women architects are let in? And that's what I think is the interesting thing about what so many of the women artists have done that's been a breakthrough. A lot of them, like Jackie Ferrara, Ellen Zimmerman, Mary Miss, um, Jackie Windsor have dealt with things that have been big, well, Nancy um, Graves too, and Louise Bourgeois, that have been dealing with men making things and men having to work with stone and uh, things that are, you know, done by factories with men in them. But the reason women could never get anywhere, I think, in architecture was because men didn't believe they could be told by a woman um, how to construct a building, that it wasn't going to be viable. They wouldn't know enough. They wouldn't be in that. But I think you just have to break it down and continue to break it down, find people that are willing to listen to what women that are qualified to have to offer. Because I think there are women out there that are qualified for these well, You mentioned Mary Miss, who's had great success. She designed yeah. Battery, the, the, that whole big area in the exactly. Battery Park. Yeah. But she told me years ago that she gave up on galleries because it was just a, a losing proposition for her. So that's why she focused on this other aspect of her art. Galleries, what you said earlier, uh, Galleries have the problem that men sell better. Why is that? Uh, there's been some pretty famous women in art, at least in the last hundred years. Does is it a matter of women having 
to uh, women who make it having to be more exceptional than male artists? Could a mediocre male artist more likely to make it than mediocre female artists? I think it's power. I think it's very, very deeply ingrained. And I think that that people want to be attached to power. Men and women alike, women can be just as sexist as men. Um, They, you know, we're so used to giving a kind of intellectual and physical authority to the male. And that is just deep. So that's what I assign it to. And I think it's very hard to wrench men and women out of that way of looking at things. It's people feel more secure, like men have more of a like economic sort of viability in the world. And men are used to this. They expect it. They're raised that way. Their mommies tell them this is how it's going to be. Everything in the world tells a man this is going to go your way. It's not that men don't have many, many different trials and tribulations and problems. And it's not that there aren't like many biological and chemical ways where we're just the same. They're just the differences are, the the samenesses are there, but the differences are huge also. Like women don't give off that feeling of wanting to take over. And also- Most women don't. And and if they do, they get into a lot of trouble fast. (laughs) And again, it's when a a dealer is trying to sell something to a person, say in the 80s, when people wanted to buy things because they believed that they should buy them for investment purposes, that they could sell them and make money. Um, What did they ask? Where is this person going? How long will this person last? What age are they? What do they do otherwise? Well, the minute you throw female into that equation, it doesn't have as much resonance as male. I know you love the Whitney Biennial, Robertus, but uh, (laughs) do we, can, we discover anything about the position of women in the art world today as we're looking at that show? Uh, I would like to say no. I think so. I think you, you can you can't you can't discover nearly enough about anything in the art world from that show, but <laughs> <laughs> including women. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, I just think that one, how is it going to change? Well, how is, how is this entire society going to change? You know, kicking and screaming, it seems to me, um, that nothing, you know, one thing can't change. The art world is not isolated from the rest of the country. So unless you have, like, half women on the board of trustees of the Museum of Modern Art, you probably, you know, that's when, you, that's when your chances of having, say, half all your department heads being women would, would, would increase. We have or, had that, we have that. But the one thing that I think is interesting is there isn't, uh, you know, when you say about the Whitney Biennial, it, I think it has to come to the point where we say that we want to have these artists included because of what they bring to the continuity of art history at MoMA. And, you know, you just don't find that happening. You come in and you want to build a collection of somebody there like they did with Picasso and Matisse and Du Buffet, and you want to build these people's art up so that you have an ability to show the public an artist's whole line of work. Well, now, where do you get that? You say, well, Eva Hesse, if you use her, they're fragile, they're difficult, they, you know, they're diff- the last, the conservancy is difficult. But, but also, they're so important. Where, but, but that's what you've got to have somebody feel, that this is a person that you've got to get the numbers of to make it understandable to people when they come and see it. And then you've got to show it. Well, it's isn't there a major uh, Eva, Eva Hesse show now circ- going around the country? But it's, but not, it's coming. not coming here. It's not coming here. And this is one of the most influential, important artists of the 70s. It's not coming here. The, the, this is, I'm not trying to make any comparison, really, because I think Matthew Barney is a very interesting artist. His show was postponed after the attack. It's postponed. It will come to the Guggenheim. The Whitney exed Eva has a show, which will cost them, somebody told me, about $250,000 to bring to the city. 
That's peanuts. That's nothing. And yet it's gone. Who made a real effort to bring it here? And it should be here. It's a tragedy. And other, other museums, I will say in their behalf, tried to get it here, but none of them managed because Museum we all have art. such long lead time. Well, the museum said they didn't have a slot. They wanted to do it. How much you can believe that, I don't know. And the Guggenheim couldn't know. cancel one of its fashion shows and put it in? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's a really a sad commentary, and I think Elizabeth's right about what it says. I mean, what it says about the fact that, again, is it really a crowd pleaser? Is it uh, going to bring people in? Is, would it be those of us that knew how important she went, was, and even though it's been so successful in San Francisco, would it draw like Richter? Every artist. Not at all. Every artist in New York <laughs> would go, if nobody else. Every artist, but yeah. that's not what the museums look for, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, you never know. I mean, she's got an interesting life story. That could be played yeah. up. It's a tragic yeah. story. Well, she died. She young. could be another, except that it, there's not, there are no portals in her work. And for a while, uh, I remember in the 60s, yes. I want to get into this just for a moment, then I want to take questions from the audience. The whole matter of women's imagery that people were talking about. I remember, I think it was Lucy Krauss said that all great women's art had portals. Rosalind Krauss or Lucy Lippard? Excuse me? I said Rosalind Krauss or Lucy Rosalind Lippard, Krauss. not Lucy No, no, Lippard. Lucy, Lucy was Lippard. Lippard. Lucy <laughs> Lippard, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I conflated two. Uh, to critics, uh, but a lot of a lot of artists talked about that. You know, the the portal thing. Um, George O'Keefe being the most famous portal artist, but I remember even Donna Dennis saying, "Well, there's a door in all of my work," uh, and uh, it it becomes a very confusing thing. There are a lot of people who looked for women's things in art. Carolee Schneeman, for example, and Anna Wilkie, and of course Judy Chicago was doing very overtly feminist work. Um, uh, thinking about you, Elizabeth, um, people have often pointed out that you employ women's imagery, uh, cups, plates, tables, chairs, and I thought, well, so did Juan Gris. Did, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I sat here drinking. Uh, do you think of what you do as having women's imagery in it? No, actually, I don't. I, I, it's. I think people need handles, but it has always kind of more interested me that I think that my, it's not women's imagery, it's psych psychology. I don't think my work is like overtly feminist, but I do think that there are probably ways where the, where the kind of imagery I'm interested in is interesting that may, maybe, possibly, men may not be interested in, but there's Cezanne who painted nothing but out, painted tons of cups and jugs and uh, apples and, uh, yeah, like endlessly, really explored that imagery. The thing that's always made me laugh is that people, like, when I make a cup image, I've never thought of it. I've always thought of it as probably, if I've thought of it at all, beyond a cup, is that it's a coffee cup. But people insist on calling them teacups, <laughs> which is just amusing, really. And I know it's because my name is Elizabeth Murray. Maybe if you just put some cigarette so. butts in there or something, it might have a whole different uh, studio but, 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 floor uh, idea. If, if Elizabeth chases, chafes at being a, a, that sort of thing, there are a lot of women who actually pushed at it, who really encouraged that sort no, of thing. No, no, I don't want you to say that. Like, you know, you just, it's, I don't chafe at it. It okay. really doesn't, I it's a like minor annoyance. It's a very minor annoyance. And it, doesn't go beneath the skin. There are others who who really called attention to women's imagery as, as part of their well, art, and I, I mean, and I wonder whether that I matters one, one way or another. One thing that's happened since nineteen seven, you know, since the seventies is. I mean, I think that the I, I think that I always felt maybe cynically that the that one of the rights that was being fought for was the right to be just as bad as men. <laughs> as artists, <laughs> that you have lots of men who have careers, yeah. who have markets, who have reputations, and you look at that and you think, well, that's not going to last. And now women are doing the same thing for various reasons. So I don't, I think there are women that use being a woman interestingly, there are women that use being a woman in completely uninteresting ways that 
could be said to be exploiting it, just as men exploit other things. So, you know, it's not, you, you can't make any conclusions like feminist art doesn't work, or, I mean, I've never heard the term portal, I have to say, I don't maybe, yeah, that's a new maybe I was absent from class that day, but. Um, you weren't reading Lucy in the 70s. I that's guess. true. Um, no, but somebody like Nan Golden, you could you could say, she's not using feminist things. She's using things of the street or of the of her personal life or of, of you know more uh, lesbian, bisexual, transvestite, a life that is broader. That I think Roberta is saying than used to be used by women and wasn't ever. I mean, if a woman wouldn't have chosen those subjects to do before because it was thought of that was just right. if even if you did have it in art it was soft porn so you had it someplace else you know, men are supposed not. to do that stuff about sex yeah. well this is this uh, question from the audience follows up on this this person says art historian slash critic barbara rose believes there is only art no feminist art please discuss how would nancy spiro fit into this? Another couple. Yes. Yeah. Now you answer that, Roberta. <laughs> you can answer. And is, is uh, Leon Golub's work really more feminist than Nancy Spiros? Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, d I think that, um, like I was just saying, I don't think that there's there are things that work by definition and things that don't work by definition. I think that that Nancy Spiro's work is interesting in terms of its subject matter, and you could say it's enlightened and it's doing a kind of excavation of, say, women from past literature or myth or whatever, but it has to succeed on its own. It has to succeed in terms of, of things that go beyond subject matter. And I think that it does some of the time. It doesn't all the time for me. But she, you know, I think she invented a real interesting way of working, like with the with the big typewriter letters and with the scrolls and all those things. So, um, you know, I think she's important as an artist. And she happen she's also important that she's a, a woman who uses women as her subject matter. But it's not, it can't, you can't separate it from other things. But can I just add that I think it's because content is what we're talking about. And people used to say all the time that Diane Arbus wasn't really a good photographer. It was just the content that interested people, mm -hmm. that she was only good because of what she chose to photograph. Well, you know, is that the case? It's, if a woman does things that are feminist, are they good because they're really good? Or are they good because only you're only saying that the content is important. Uh, well, first the, of we, all, we're really saying is there's two audiences here, aren't we? There are, there are people who will respond simply because they see it as feminist or non-feminist or whatever, and then there are others who are looking for some kind of a, a higher aesthetic, exactly. if that's possible. But the and whole art world is just a continual argument about what's good and what isn't. You know, yeah. basically, all we're doing is arguing. What's interesting about the art world is that it's free. You know, you don't have, I mean, we have a market in a way, but it's pretty shaky, and it's its not regulated. We don't have a, whatever it's called. Yeah, we, don't have a, we don't have a stock market. We don't yeah. have, so the whole thing well, we have is up in the market. air, and everybody's making yeah, their Liz point and, and arguing, and we're just going to have to see how it turns out. I have some other. Well, points. no, I think that's that's that is the you point. You know, the, like the, ultimately. Every, the, that's what makes it. That's what's fun about it, and it's what's happened lately is that the argument has gotten much, much more complicated, and that is good. And broader, and much broader in yeah, the, and much yeah. more conscious. Yeah, you know. But less theoretical. At least I remember in the fifties and sixties talking to artists, and they were always reading books on aesthetics and discussing these arcane points and. Nobody seems to think well, about this. Well, that goes on with some artists, and some of them make arcane art, and some of them make really accessible art out of out of their arcane reading. Well, Mark Tansy is an interesting artist in that he, you know, uses philosophy in his, uh, and and some people take to it, some people don't. I mean, it depends on how you. 
want to read it, whether you want to search or not search. <laughs> this one is for you, Aggie. Um, how do we get more or any artists on the board of museums across the country? Well, it's an interesting, um, it's really an interesting question because when I became president of MoMA, the first thing I wanted to do was get to have some artists on the board. And then um, I, as I sat on the board, I realized that it really wasn't the, the place to have artists because the board uh, really can't, first of all, they are not supposed to, and they don't, in my opinion, at least not that I've experienced on the modern, make the decisions as to who, uh, what shows are given and what artists get the major shows and what artists are in the shows. So I thought rather than, um, I thought the best way to use artists at MoMA was the way Kirk did with artist choice shows. Well, now you can say, well, the only woman he got to do a show was Elizabeth, and that was after four men had already done shows. Um, and then he, there wasn't room to do more of them, so you couldn't really use artists. But I think what, with conversations with artists, the thing we do with having artists talk about the works that are really good, and having really more artists shows things, that's one thing I've done with my gift to MoMA, is to, to support an artist show, uh, a long um, series of artist shows, um, choice shows there, because I think when you get artists to make that kind of comment on the collection of a museum and the way they look at art, you get them to do more than sitting on a board. What a board really does, which is pretty dull and pretty uninteresting, is really try to raise money. Um, we are, are lucky because we have a fantastic um, development director, so it helps us to be able to do that, but in the end, that's what the purpose, you serve on committees, but you don't, you know, I've been so frustrated because what I'd love to do more than anything is be able to do. Uh, but I think they do more than that. I mean, you pick architects for one thing, wow. which has a tremendous impact on museums. And I, you know, I think there's, there's, there's a system for having I'm, I object to the fact that museums are made, that museum boards are made up entirely of rich people. I don't think that needs to be the case. Well, I think I, that uh, artists have a kind of... Expected to give money. That's I think there are other... I mean, I know that Robert Rosenblum has been involved, at a certain point was involved with in the my, painting and sculpture very, committee. Very, very involved. So but there, then he went to take a job at, at the Guggenheim, so he couldn't stay on the... Right, but it seems to me that you just have to think about that people have different contributions to make, and they have, and that their contribution yeah. is just as important. But, but we have... The, the reason I would say, you know, and I think you have a point about contribution, but how can Chuck Close really contribute to well, the Tate, when... Well, the, the National Gallery in London has artists on the board. They're on, for, and so does the Tate. They're on they for have a certain... a lot of artists. You can't just have it right, like they having have a token. Term. So it's... Um, but, but what do you... What are you able to contribute besides what many people who have art history degrees can contribute on in that term? Because you can't really... Um, you're never able as a trustee, and I agree with you, I wish it wasn't all rich people, and the trouble is it's getting to be so that people that really don't have much money but have some feel very badly being on boards because they, they work hard and they don't get the recognition because they're not rich and they're not able to call the shots and make the statements and... and Great, there are museums of Viennese art. And, and it's very, well, you know, don't laugh at that. It's a fabulous museum. I mean, I think nobody should take down on what Ronald's done and what Ronald's achieved. But the, at the same time, the trustees are very handicapped in that some of them want to be able to do curation, which Ronald has done and done beautifully, but he built a museum to do it. Um, I'm not able to do that, so I don't get to do anything. I just have to worry about raising the money and where the money comes from to buy these very expensive works of art. But I don't get to ever have an input that I would like to see a show of 
you know, so-and-so there, but, you know, you don't get to do that as a trustee. So in many ways, I think having an artist means that you have all the baggage that that artist has, which is the gallery. I mean, many people complain already that our, our, we have all pace artists that show, or all so-and-so artists, and it's true, all the shows, a lot of the shows we have, the people, you know, have come from one gallery or another. Person. Now, you know, that's gonna happen, but, you know, it's gonna be like you say, well, look at what happened with the collection we got from Payne Weber, which was a marvelous gift. But you know who got into the collection for the first time? Via Selman's and Lorna Simpson. Really? They weren't in the lot. collection before that was given. Now, that was a man that did that. That was a trustee. That was. Okay, no, well, 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 I, I want to go into some more, but I do have to no, ask I mean, Elizabeth would you like to be on the board of the museum? Uh, um, no, I wouldn't. Uh, I, no, but that's like, I think that artists, I agree with Roberta. Um, some artists, I'm too thin-skinned, and I'm on, for instance, I'm on the Andy Warhol, I'm one of the directors on the Andy Warhol Foundation, and I find it, I get to know more than I want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know these things. I don't want to be in the inside, and I don't want to know but who's. Then you agree with me because that's what. <laughs> well, some I think some artists really can deal with that, but I. I mean, Michael Craig really Martin was on the board of the Tate during this whole time. He's an artist during this whole time that they took the took the new building and converted mm -hmm. it. But do you know that? how different the Tate is from the modern? Do you know how different English museums are run? Totally. They don't have to make their money. No, they don't I, have I to. completely understand the we difference, but I'm just saying money. that that's an interesting example to consider. And there has to be a way that it might be modified and, and you know. But we have to raise money for acquisitions, for all these departments, um, all the exhibitions. The, the Tate doesn't have to do that. The Tate goes along, they build a building, they get it half built, which it is. It, they didn't have the money mm -hmm. for half of it. They get a lot of the money from America. Do you suppose we get any English money for the modern? Not a penny, I can tell you. You should see the roster of people yeah, that have given money to the Tate. No, I'm think not, about this. I mean, it just it, seems to me it's just something, to, it's something worth trying to try. I would love to see it. Tried. I don't think it would work because I wanted it very much and then I began to look at what it really would do. If we had gotten my artist that I had wanted, I won't say who, to be on the board because I thought that he, in this case, would have had great insight. Mm -hmm. Where would he have put the insight? I hate to sound like a man, but can we get back to women in art? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, There are some other questions here about women in art. Uh, your thoughts on girl art, women photographers out of the Yale MFA program. Have you any thoughts on that? Um, it's produced some good artists and some bad artists, and because it's Yale and because of the, the work is often kind of titillating, it's gotten a lot of attention. So, again, this is something that will be worked out. You know, some of the attention will fall away from some of those artists. Girls photographing girls has become extremely tired. There are very few people that can do it um, well right now. And it's just one of those, there are things, you know, what's, what's different is that it's art by women about women. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes other, some people find it interesting. Some people find it suspicious because of that. They're entitled to have their moment of glamour and to, like, to be hot and to be overestimated and underestimated and, you know, the whole thing. So it's, it, you know, I'm sure that it's overestimated to a certain extent. Sounds like a time. But, but that doesn't, ex doesn't mean that there aren't a few good people in it, that's all. Are there certain genres or mediums of art, we could have said media, uh, sculpture, performance, etc., that women have had a greater level of success in than traditional painting, and why is this the case? Aggie, I know you know the answer. I think. Photography. And video now, I think. Because people don't really know, have to know who it is that's making it. They look again, I think it's content driven, it's driven by what is you're seeing, rather than who 
made it. I mean, when you go into one of those black boxes, I mean, for, for my mind, I can't, I have to look, I can't look at the name very often of who's doing it. I look at the piece and then I found out who's done it and it's very often um, a woman these days and it's very often uh, very good. With photography, I think the same thing. It's been easier for women to always to, to be photographers and sell photography. Um, well, I think one thing that's important is that in all of these media, you don't have a huge history behind you. Right. And I think I think women were come into from the start. Video, well, film into film and photography. That that it's liberating. Yeah. That that there's probably more to do, and there's less to think about that's already been done, and there are less kind of prejudices about it. That's that's the answer. So that <laughs> you know, it's a, it's. And once you have a giant or two and photography's had its share, then women are more encouraged to go yeah. into it as well. This person asks you, Roberta, talk about your references to women's life stories. Do you mean media spin? Do women need the story? Do I mean, say that again? I'm going to give it to you because the handwriting is difficult Do to read. Do women need the story? I don't think, I think that... Um, Unfortunately, all artists need the story, <clears throat> in that in that people are more, the general public is more interested in the artist's biography than in the work, and and given that they're prone to be less interested in women than in men, and given that women are objectified in our society more than men, women get a lot more out of their story if it's a certain kind of story. Unfortunately, or they get. If they don't have one, they get less. So unfortunately, they all need the story, and women probably need it more. Well, and but men do as well. Because our society doesn't really look at art that much. I remember when Ad Reinhardt shocked a class by saying he didn't, he said, I don't know much about Van Gogh. He cut off his ear, didn't he? And there was this gasp, you know, but he was saying, the reason you are so obsessed by Van Gogh is because he cut off his ear, not because not because the work is better than Cezanne's or Surratt's or or whoever else he thought was better than Van Gogh. Ad didn't like anybody; it was an expressionist anyway. But um, the the point was still well taken, wasn't it? And you're saying the same thing. But do you to some extent, that I don't. You know, I think Van Gogh is a great painter. It's just that he lives in the public imagination in yeah, a different the story way is, than the Cezanne story is so does. Big. But do you think really now? that you would have to say that the reason Van Gogh is the most popular artist, at least by what he brings in auction, um, is, is that... Sure, was he the best artist? Was, was he better than Cezanne? No, but I don't think you have to say that. Aren't those paintings so appealing? I think the I paintings mean, are more accessible in some ways, I mean, too. So that's, that's what it reflects. They're so live, alive, and they're so incredible. I mean... I think it's that, and the subject matter's not that either. I've know. never got it, so I don't know. Well, I don't know. Did, did this question get answered? Yeah. Okay. okay. The drawings. Look at the drawings. I mean, the draftsmanship. I mean, it's just. Crazy. You're not talking, Elizabeth. Um, oh, you know, I was just thinking uh, when you said we were talking about men are skin. I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, Aggie. You mentioned. Uh, orchestras, uh, orchestra only after. Uh oh. Can you read this? It's a, it's a good handwriting, but I don't get it. And um, it's for Aggie. You, know, you mentioned orchestra, but only after orchestras started using screens uh, for blind auditions did the number of women increase. Is there a parallel in the art world for women? Hmm. That's an interesting thing. I. I I don't think, unfortunately, there is a parallel book because I think um, there's no way to, you know, hide the the name. I mean, to put something forth in the art world and the, you know, without a name attached to it, you can't really put somebody behind a screen with an artwork. It's a different thing than playing or than conducting or that where you could you know, clothe the person so that they weren't recognizable and see what they did or hear them audition. I, I think um, 
it's amazing because the Vienna Orchestra, again, I'm not meaning to get, does some people I know won't go to hear them because they don't have any women. But I think that that's different. I mean, I think that this is sort of true in that women with art, you have the opportunity for a kind of separation between the maker and the result or the product, whatever you want to call it, that you don't have with if somebody's a musician. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you, you can see what the name is, but I think that in a way, all art, you look at all art from behind a blind, because ultimately, your eye is what does the looking. And sooner or later, you're going to have to let go of all this stuff about the story, about the name, and you're just going to have to look at the object and figure out what you think, if you're really interested in staying with the object. So I, I actually, you know, I mean, that's sort of the point I made when I started. I just, when we started here, that... But, but if, except how could you have a museum, say, choose and select an artist with, from works of art? Could you bring the art piece in to say to a committee, are we going to... Uh, no, I'm not saying that, the, that there should be no labels on things. I'm just saying that I'm sort of speaking more philosophically. If just saying that, yeah. that ultimately that kind of separation is possible because unlike any other art form, acting, dance, the, there's an object, and the maker becomes separate. What you do with art is let is set it out in the world. And we, we love and cherish all kinds of objects. We know nothing about the gender or the maker. I mean, it's quite, it seems quite obvious, like if you think about ceramics, for example. You know. No, I think, but that brings me to a, a point that we didn't bring up about whether you identify certain objects with certain genders of artists. We were talking about craft being identified, and the Museum of Modern Art is really kind of bad about craft. If it's craft, they don't consider it art, and so they don't ex access it except in design, and if it doesn't really fit in as a design object, they, they won't take it into the collection. That, that seems to me that that's a bit of a sort of blind screening about art that is by women, um, that's already screened them out without... And during you know. the 60s, there was a time when there were a number of women who were making art using craft techniques, using sewing into cloth. And yeah, but I think that, you know, when we're talking about, point. again, you can't separate out what's happened to women to what's happened to other things. And the last 30 years has been about this relaxation of a lot of barriers so that you have women coming, becoming more visible in the art world at the same time that you have the kind of hierarchy, the domination of painting is, is much more relaxed. And craft, you know, there, it's fine if some of that stuff is in the design department. What I'm interested in is design being taken as seriously. Now, the modern has always done that. You know, so that the whole, if it, the whole idea is that design need, can, needs to be elevated as a field. And, but why is it that, that the modern has always shied away? Is it because they really don't think it's any good, or is it because it's made out of um, clay that they don't take a, a, a figure of Mary Frank, say, that they wouldn't take that into the collection? Well, I, I think some of that is definitely, in the last 20 years, being broken down, being really broken down and, and rethought. But I think that part of what goes on with thinkers about art and people who really look is that there has been this prejudice that is totally wrong. I mean, every artist of any ilk designs form and content depend upon arrangement. And it's, it's the context, I think, in which people are willing to like look at what design is, like how a quilt is designed and thought about. Isn't, there's just a hierarchy. And the modern was based on modernism and Picasso and Matisse and Brock and Cubism and this kind of wet, this whole style of painting that was so powerful and overwhelming. And that was so, I think it really did put blinders on. And the people who promoted it had the power there. And they wanted to see design in a certain kind of way. This, there's, we've run out of time, but there's one last question. I'm not sure you can even ask it, Elizabeth, that's directed at you. Are you a gorilla girl, as I think? If so, why? <laughs> um, only in spirit. <laughs> no, I'm not. 
I've always supported them and I've sent them money and I think what they do, especially in the 80s, um, has been fantastic. They And talk about design. They really figured out a way to get their ideas across in a very simple, direct, sexy kind of way. And they've been very effective in terms of doing it. So let me follow up that with a, a sense that I've gotten from this conversation that although things have been proved, the guerrilla girls and activists like them are as needed as much today as they were Absolutely. 20 years ago. Very much so. Yeah, and I think it's great that you've done this and, and that you ask us to do it and that Aggie and Roberta have been totally frank and honest and it's really interesting. It's been fascinating for us all. I want to thank you all. Elizabeth Murray, Agnes Gunn, Roberta Smith, thank you all for coming. And thanks to the Y for allowing us to do this sort of thing. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.